So um, we mentioned a few things in our kind of core concepts. Is that the atomic number is equivalent to the number of protons in an atom. Okay. And since atoms are neutral, in the atom the number of protons is equivalent to the number of electrons. So like in aluminum, its atomic number is 13, which means it has 13 protons and it has 13 electrons. We also discussed the concept of mass number. And we figured since protons and neutrons are thousands times larger than electron, those are only two subatomic particles that contribute to the mass of an atom, right? So mass number represents the total number of protons and neutrons together. So for instance, mass number for same aluminum is 27 and atomic number for aluminum is 13 which means aluminum has 13 protons and 14 neutrons. Does that make sense? Total number of neutrons and protons gives you 27. Okay? So to kind of exemplify what we were talking about there are some examples here. So look at the hydrogen. Its atomic number is 1. And its mass number is 1. Which means its nucleus is only one proton. I'm not going to mention electrons because the number of electrons will be always the same as the number of protons. Are we clear on that? Mm -hmm. Look at nitrogen. Its atomic number is 7. Mass number 14. We do the difference. So number of protons is 7, atomic number. Atom, uh, number of neutrons is 14 minus 7, also 7. Does that make sense? Oxygen, atomic number is 8, mass number 16. So 8 protons, 8 neutrons. Chlorine, Atomic number 17, mass number 37. 17 neutrons, 20 protons. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to talk about iron and gold. I mean, you can do calculations if you want. Not a problem. I want to ask you a slightly different question. Which is kind of important. Kind of important. Really important. So, for nitrogen, the atomic number is 7. Okay, the mass number is 14. Okay, so how many protons this particular nitrogen has? Seven. How many neutrons? Seven. Seven. Now, imagine that I have an atom that also has seven protons, but instead of seven neutrons, it has eight. What's going to be the mass number? Yes, 15, absolutely. What's going to be the symbol for this atom? What's going to be the element here? That's not a tricky question. Just nitrogen. Because what did we change? The amount of nitrogen. nutrients. Did we change a charge? No. So, what's the difference between nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15? Those are two different isotopes. Have you heard this word? Isotope. Sorry for my writing. I-S-O-T-O-P-E. Isotope. Isn't the mass? Oh yeah, it's going to be totally different. So you're absolutely right. Nitrogen 14 is lighter than nitrogen 15. Does that make sense? 
Look at the table. Hydrogen here has an atomic number and mass number of one, right? Mm -hmm. So nucleus is only one proton. Are you with me? Imagine that I add to the nucleus of hydrogen one neutral. So now the nucleus has a proton and a neutron. You with me? It's going to be the mass number for such element. Two. Two. Now, this element is still hydrogen. It's just a heavy hydrogen. Sometimes it is called deuterium. Have you heard the expression heavy water? It is used in nuclear technology. Okay? Does that make sense? Another example, I'm not going to go into the politics of it, but the biggest problem with Iranian nuclear program is that, bless you, is that they have special devices to enrich, uh, if my memory serves me well, uh, they enrich uranium, they have mined for uranium-238, which is the main isotope. I always, always mix up the two. There's two isotopes. Uranium-235 and Uranium-238. One of them can be used in an atomic bomb. Okay? So they basically enrich for the one that can be used in an atomic bomb. What's the difference between these two isotopes? One, I don't remember which one. Never could remember. One is super stable. You can like put it on this table, it's going to stay there forever. And another one can serve as the nuclear fuel and, you know, explosive in an atomic bomb. Does that make sense? But chemically, and that's really important, chemically, isotopes have exactly the same properties. If you will use water that contains regular hydrogen with atomic number of 1, and heavy water, which contains hydrogen with uh, um, sorry, mass number 1 versus mass number 2, use heavy water, chemically it's the same water doesn't differ. Does that make sense? So these two nitrogens that I pictured for you, nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15, their chemical properties are the same. Does that make sense to you? They cannot be chemically isolated from each other. You see what I'm saying? Now, why I say that it's ironically kind of relevant? It's not kind of relevant. It is very relevant. For instance, uh, there are some medical techniques, imaging techniques, like um, gamma cannon, for instance. Have you heard about gamma cannon? So it's a technique to destroy tumors. Basically, one of the isotopes of the element called cobalt, <coughs> it's cobalt-60, is unstable isotope. And since it's unstable, it it's radioactive, okay? And it's radioactivity, it emits gamma rays, high energy radiation, which scientists learned to focus in a tiny little pin, like a dot. And they direct that ray, that gamma ray, they direct it onto the tumor and burn it out without damaging any other tissues. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's... This technology is really um, took off in the last maybe 10, 15 years. So for treatment of, like, you know, you don't want to dig into a patient's brain to cut the tumor out. So you burn it up without, basically, or with a minimal damage to the adjacent tissue. Does that make sense? So isotopes, there are labeling technologies, for instance, to identify the... Thyroid tumors, scientists use radioactive isotopes of iodine. Also, to destroy thyroid tumors, they use radioactive isotopes of iodine. So, there are plenty of use for isotope technologies, in not only in scientific research, but in medicine as well. Okay? Just wanted to make a case for isotopes and give you an idea that two isotopes, they belong to the same element like nitrogen-14 and nitrogen-17, and they're chemically identical. And all the difference between them is the different number of neutrons. We're good? We're clear? 
Moving on. So let's chat a little bit about the distribution of electrons, the different energy levels in an atom. When you see light, like this rainbow, you see different colors which belong to different wavelengths of the visible light in the electromagnetic spectrum. Does that make sense? And we're going to learn what's the difference between different colors and what is electromagnetic spectrum in general. So electromagnetic radiation is basically the form of energy. There is something very odd to electromagnetic radiation. When you look at the light, is light a wave or is light a particle? What do you think? Huh? Wave made That's basically the right answer, but it's so it's a little bit more mind-boggling than that because it possesses the properties of both wave and a particle. So it's not just particles going in waves. It's just it's really like when Louis de Broglie suggested that it's both. The French dude, he smoked some pretty heavy weed. Um, well, otherwise you cannot come up with the idea that the same type of energy can be a wave in one circumstances and a particle in different circumstances. That makes sense? So that's, and to me, like you can accept this idea and you can work with, with this idea, but I don't really think that anybody truly understands this idea, okay? So, for our intents and purposes so far, we can actually, we'll have to use both our ideas, that it's a wave and it's a particle, but mostly we're going to talk about the light, it's the wave, okay? So, electromagnetic spectrum goes all the way from radio waves and microwaves, the one that you use in the microwave oven, those are really low frequency waves to extremely high frequency waves like X-rays and gamma rays, okay? And the frequency and the wavelength are two concepts that are opposite, but they're talking basically about the same thing. Imagine that you are standing on the shore of a lake or the ocean and waves are coming towards you. That makes sense. So they hit your feet with a certain frequency. So that frequency, the time between hits depends on the speed of the water, right? The, the, how fast it goes and the distance between the waves. If the distance is really short, if the waves are really close to each other, the frequency will increase. Does that make sense? So high frequency. Now, high frequency corresponds to the shorter waves. Is that understood? Frequency corresponds to the shorter waves. Frequency, frequency higher frequency. Higher frequency. FR means frequency equals shorter wavelength. So, for instance, microwaves have pretty low frequency. So the waves are really long. On the other hand, X-rays have really high frequency. So the waves are very, very short. And general idea is that the shorter the wavelengths, the higher the energy. Are we clear? Does that make sense? The shorter the wavelengths, it's right there, the higher the energy. Okay? 
So high energy corresponds to shorter wavelength. So basically, what do you think? Are there radio waves, which are like super long, are there radio waves going through that room right now? Well, if you would have an FM receiver, you would know, oh yeah, there are plenty. You could get virtually any radio station. When you're in the car, the bunch of radio waves go through you. You don't feel them, though. I mean, you're not getting hurt or anything. Now, for one second, imagine that there's x-ray going through this room. I would want to immediately leave it. Because if we're exposed to it long enough, we're going to die. Okay? Because the energy of x-rays, since they're much shorter, the energy is much higher. Does that make sense? Yes. I just have a question. Um, MRIs, is that used? That's really, really low waves. You said long? Low energy. This is why MRI is considered to be as benign as it can be. Okay. Does that make sense? So, basically, you don't get any actual radiation exposure when you get MRI. Does that make sense? So far, we're good. Now, if you would take, and that, that was basics of optics and physics and nuclear physics for a long time, the method. So you take a chemical and you burn it in the flames of the Bunsen burner, like the one that you have on your tables in the lab room. And it will produce a certain color. If you have a gas stove at home, anyone has a gas stove? Okay, you have a gas stove. So what, what, what is the normal color of the flames? Blue. Blue. Well, take some sodium chloride, table salt, or baking soda, it doesn't matter. On the tip of the spoon, stick it in the flames. Well, yellow. Yeah. It will immediately become yellow. Because sodium, mm -hmm. when it's in the flames, the color that it gives to the light is yellow. Lithium gives green, as far as I remember. Calcium is green. Um, no, barium is green. Calcium, I think, is red. So there are different colors to each element. But obviously, you know, there will be, there's only so many colors. You know, I really like the difference between the male perception of colors and female perception of colors. Like pink, purple, I don't know, magenta, some other, those are all different colors for female. For male, it's all red. So, but for, you know, there's a limited number of colors, like red, yellow, green, blue, purple. But there are 100 plus elements. Is there a difference in the emission the light that atoms of elements emit when they are stuck in the flames? The answer is yes. So what you need for this is a prism. If you would stick some of the chemical, like in this example, it's the salt of barium, say barium chloride. Okay. You stick it into the Bunsen burner. You're going to see the green flames. Okay, the color is green. That makes sense? Now, on the way of that green light, you put a prism. And prism has this interesting optical property that it will separate the light into its individual components based on the individual wavelengths. And it turns out, and it's really, now, look, this is what's cool. Did you see, well, you all saw rainbow, right? Rainbow doesn't have like lines. It's what's like uh, red kind of fuses into the orange, orange fuses into the yellow and so on and so forth, right? So you may expect the same rainbow distribution from the green light that comes out of an element, maybe with a predominance of green. 
it turns out that it's not going to be a continuous spectrum. It's going to be a set of lines. Can you see the set of lines? Let me, let me blow it up, actually. Do you see the set of lights, uh, the, the lines? Yes. So it tells you one really important thing about the light that elements emit. They emit very well-defined wavelengths, meaning that each of these lines, each of these lines in this, in this image, it is a certain energy. Does that make sense? Because each of these lines belongs to a certain wavelength. Are we clear? So what I'm trying to tell you is that okay, let's talk about where this, where this light is coming from and then we will figure out why it's just independent lines, not the continuous spectrum, okay? So, it turns out that, let me go forward a little bit and then I will, I will come back. So, it turns out that electrons that move around the nucleus. They are moving at the certain energy levels. So think about electrons living on the different floors of a building. Does that make sense? People who live on the first floor versus people who live on the second, third, fourth, and so on and so forth. Does that make sense? People don't live in the ceiling. They don't live between the floors. They live strictly on the first, or on the second, or on the third. Does that make sense? To go from the first floor, or first energy level, to the second energy level, electrons have to absorb the energy. Is that clear? When you stick electrons in the flame, where do they get energy from? The flame. And then they go up the level. Does that make sense? They move from the first floor to the second floor. Now, in real life, when you go from the first floor to the second floor, do you have to absorb, get some energy from somewhere, from, from your body, right? And then electrons, they jump back from the second floor back to the first. Now, if you jump back from the second floor to the first, you will have a kinetic energy at the end. Does that make sense? When electrons move down to the lower energy level, they emit the light. Does that make sense? No? Okay, again. When electrons absorb the, absorb the energy from the flames, they go up the level. And then, when they go down, they emit this light. Now, my question for you is, can you explain why there are individual spectral lines and not the continuous spectrum? Huh? And can they go from the third floor to the second and a half floor? No. The difference between the energy levels is fixed. Does that make sense? So when electron goes from the third to the second energy level, it emits a certain amount of energy which corresponds to a certain line. Does that make sense? It can't go just a wee bit more or a wee bit less. It will go from the third to the second. 
my clear. When it goes from, I don't know, fifth to fourth, that's the different energy that also corresponds to a particular line. You see what I'm trying to say? It can't go from the fifth floor to somewhere in between the third and the fourth. And another electron cannot go from the fifth to slightly lower than the first one. They, if the electron goes from fifth to fourth, it's always going to be the same energy, the same wavelength, the same line. Are we clear? Does that make sense? This gives us an incredibly powerful tool to analyze chemicals, to analyze stars, to analyze environmental samples. One of my favorite stories about the power of spectral analysis comes from the personal account of American physicist Robert Williams Wood who was quite a character. When he was young, uh, he was doing some scientific work in Switzerland. And he was living in basically like an apartment, okay? And they had a, a, a restaurant. So meals were included, okay? And he noticed an interesting pattern in the meals. He noticed that the beef stew on Tuesday always was after the like, meat roulette on Monday. So on Monday there's meat roulette, on Tuesday there's beef stew. On, I don't know, Friday there's beef roulette, on Saturday there's beef stew. He got really suspicious. So he realized that probably all the unfinished roulette pieces were collected in the kitchen and were reused in the kitchen to cook beef stew. Which is pretty good. Yeah, I agree with that. How can you prove that? So what he did, he left several pieces of that meat roulette on the plate and he covered them with lithium chloride. No, not you. It's absolutely benign. Absolutely like nothing, not toxic. Next day, he collected fragments of the beef stew, put them in the lab, burned them in the Bunsen burner, and so the lithium lines bright and clear. So the stuff that he left on the plate yesterday appeared in today's meal. So definitely his roulette went into recycling, you know. That, and that was just traces of lithium. That gives you an idea how powerful this analysis is, okay? So we can analyze for the presence of those lithium or chloride or, I don't know, calcium, whatever, in compounds and tissues, whatnot, at, at the very, very small minute amounts. Does that make sense? So we have figured that electrons have their own energy levels. Energy levels are assigned quantum numbers. So here we're going to be talking only about one type of a quantum number, which is principal quantum number. It basically tells you on which floor the electron lives. Do I make sense? So if principal quantum number is 1, that says this electron is closest to the nucleus. Does that make sense? If it's two, it's the second level from the nucleus, second shell. If it's three, third shell. The higher the number, the higher the energy of the level. Does it make sense? Do you understand what I'm saying? We good? Okay. Now, not only this implies that electrons can move from one level to another, it also implies that energy of any electron is quantized. And this is a pretty mind-boggling concept. 
that was introduced in physics by German scientist Max Planck. So he suggested that electrons, when they move from one energy level to another, can only give out a certain amount of energy. So we see these lines. So we don't see a continuous spectrum. Does that make sense? So he actually, sorry, he actually introduced that idea. I mean, a bit more complex idea, but the point was that electrons can go only from level one to level two. Like, let me explain. If you give them energy, not enough to go from level one to level two, they won't go anywhere. They won't get to the ceiling. Does that make sense? They won't go halfway. They won't go at all. Does that make sense? And that means that when they go from level 2 to level 1, they give out a certain amount of energy. They can't go just a wee bit lower. It's always going to be all or none. Does that make sense? Which kind of contracts everything that we know. Let me explain. If I will apply just a little bit of energy to this table, I can lift it a little bit off the ground. If I will apply more energy, I can lift it more. Does that make sense? If I will make a really big effort, I'll probably can lift it up. But it's gradual. It's not quantized. I can regulate the amount of energy that I apply to that table. And the whole physics, all physics concepts to that point dealt with energy as the continuous effort. So you could give as much energy as you want, you could get back as much energy as you want. That makes sense. The idea of quanta, that wee bit of energy, was so revolutionary that Max Planck didn't believe in his own concept. Although everybody was using it, and he was using it, he got Nobel Prize for it, but by the time he died, he didn't believe it. He thought that it was completely crazy, it was insane, it was not physics. But it worked. You know. So that's kind of interesting. Now that's just an example of electromagnetic spectrum. And that shows you the arrangement of all the wavelengths. You do not need to memorize whatever the order or anything. What I'm trying to tell you is that actually humans of pretty limited capacity. So you see this, this colorful bands, the rainbow bands? That's the part of electromagnetic spectrum that we can actually see. That's what you see. There's a bunch of ultraviolet, infrared, radio waves, microwaves, X-rays, gamma rays that we don't see. Okay? We don't really appreciate the presence. To be honest, the majority of animals, they may kind of shift a little bit towards UV, a little bit towards infrareds, but that's about it. Okay. Nobody can see X-rays or gamma rays in the living, among the living creatures. Now, what's important, you can observe an element in visible light, or you can observe it in infrared, or X-rays, there are filters to do that, or gamma rays. You can get the photograph of the sun in X-rays, because sun emits X-rays. Sun emits gamma rays, sun emits infrared, sun emits radio waves. You can get photographs of the sun in each of the spectrum using special filters. It's not really a photograph. You know, it's kind of rendering what it would look if we would be able to see that. Yes? And as it stands for nanometers. Nanometers, yes. So, nanometers, yes, that's the wavelength, 700 to 400 nanometers, that's what we can see. 700 corresponds to um, red, like really, really red. 400 nanometers corresponds to blue. So red is the longest waves, okay, the longest wavelength, and blue has the shortest wavelength, yes. So when we're saying nanometers, is it like 700? Let me draw it. It's a good question. So now I apologize for the waves that are going to appear on the screen, okay?
So those are two waves. Okay? It's a wavelength between the peaks. Okay? Between two peaks, that's the wavelength. Make sense? Now that concept we already tackled. Electrons occupy certain energy levels. All right now that arrangement is like really terrible. Think about this. If you, well, I mean, it depends on where you live, but imagine hypothetically you have an empty building, a bunch of people that start to get into that building based on like energy preference. Which floor will be occupied first? First, yeah, because you don't have to move your stuff higher. When first floor is totally occupied, people will move to the second floor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. When second floor is completely occupied, people would move to the third floor. Now, if we would substitute floors with the energy levels and people with electrons, you would say, and it will go on, third floor is full, the fourth floor will come in, and then if it, it's a little bit more tricky, starting at about the third level, so we're not going to go into the electron arrangements for the third level, okay? But you get the basic idea. The energy levels with the lowest energy will be occupied first. Does that make sense? That's number one. And number two, when electron goes from higher level to the lower level, it will emit light. Is that clear? Is that clear? <clears throat> now, sort of a biological connection. Have you heard the term photosynthesis? That's what plants do to... If you think that they do it to produce oxygen, I disappoint you. They actually do it to produce some sugars, okay, store nutrients. Oxygen is just a waste. But one of the first steps of photosynthesis is practically this, this one. The energy of light is absorbed by electrons. The electrons are energized. That's the first step of photosynthesis. Does that make sense? So let's take a look at some energy levels. Now, if you have your books, uh, basically if you have a periodic table fairly close to you, it would be useful to open it up and take a look at it. Now, look at the period one. How many elements are in the period one? Two. Which are helium and hydrogen. Very good. How many energy levels do they have? Only one. Okay. How many electrons does hydrogen have? One. How many electrons does helium have? Two. Two. Uh, remember we were talking about different groups of elements? Helium belongs to the eighth principal group. What is, what is another name of this group? Noble gases. Why do we call them that? They do not react with anything because the electron levels are full. They don't need anything. They they perfect. Does that make sense? So it turns out that for the first energy level, the maximum number of electrons is two. That's it. You can't stick more than two. Imagine there's a building, and on the first floor there can be only two tenants. That's it. Is that understood? For only this. For only first period. Only on the first energy level, only first energy level, you can squeeze two electrons, not more. Others are going to be slightly different. So let's move on to period two. How many energy levels? 
two, just two, first and second, right? Now, without talking about the elements yet, if you'll move to third period, how many energy levels? Three, fourth, four. So, period number, what does it tell you? Number of energy levels. Does that make sense? That's the law. Does that make sense? It gives you a number of the floors in a building. Now, let me ask you another question. Remind me, please, we mentioned that. Which energy level is closer to the nucleus? First, yes. <clears throat> now, which particles are at each energy level? Let, let me explain. In my, my habit is when I ask you questions, unless I specifically say it's a tricky question or hard question, the questions that I ask are dumb. Like, dumb. So, which particles are on the energy level? Which particles are on these energy levels? These numbers. They show the number of what? Electrons. How do electrons, how are they charged? Negatively. We got it? How is nucleus charged? Nope. Positively. Protons, right? Protons in the nucleus. So, nucleus is positive. Electrons are negative. What do they do to each other? They attract. That makes sense? Which electrons on which energy level will attract stronger? The ones that are closer to the nucleus in the first one, or the ones that are farther from the nucleus? Closer. Closer, yeah. So basically, I'm kind of guiding you to some of the principles. You have, for now, just have an idea. The closer electrons are to the nucleus, the stronger they're being attracted to it. The stronger they're being held, by the nucleus. That makes sense. Got it? Let's take a look at the electron arrangement. So elements of the second period, how many electrons do they have on the first energy level? Oh, uh, 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 no, that wasn't planned, I'm sorry. How many electrons do they have on the first energy level? Is it full? Yes. Excellent, full. We don't really have to care about it. All apartments are filled with tenants. Let's take a look at the second. Lithium. Which group does it belong? Nope. Look at the group one. How many electrons on the outer shell? One. Beryllium. Which group does it belong? Beryllium. Second. How many electrons? No, no, no. We're talking only about the outermost shell, the second. Two. Let's talk about the outermost shell. Uh, nitrogen, which group does it belong to? Nitrogen. Which principal group? Five. How many electrons are on the second or outer shell? Five. I don't understand anything you talk about right now. Okay, so do you have... You're looking at the principal groups, the ones that we were talking about. 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A. It's 1A, 2A. Those are groups, right? Okay. So we're trying to figure out which group does the element belong to. So take a look. Can you find nitrogen in the periodic table? What is the nitrogen? N. Okay. Can you find it? Yes. Yes. Which group does it belong to? 5. 5A. A means principal group. Oh. Okay. Now, it belongs to the fifth principal group. And how many electrons does nitrogen have on the outer shell? So it's five. 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 Now, look at fluorine, F. Atomic number is nine. Which principal group does it belong to? Seven. Seven. How many electrons on the outer shell? Seven. Seven. What does the group number tell you? How many electrons are on the outer shell? Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Now, neon. Which group does it belong to? Eight principal group, absolutely right. How many electrons? Eight. On the outer, eight. 
So one of the rules of periodic table is that for the outer shell, the maximum number of electrons is always eight, except for the first period. For the first period, it's two. Second, third, fourth, fifth, any period after the first, the number of electrons on the outer shell is always eight. Yes. Okay, here you're talking about the, the first and second. What is this first and second coming from? This ones? Those are energy levels. Electron so energy levels. Just memorize the, I mean, where did it refer to? I mean, to what? Energy levels? Yeah. That's what I'm trying to tell you. I'm trying to tell you that elements of the first period, hydrogen and helium, have only one energy level because they are in the first period. Elements of the second period have two energy levels. Okay. Elements of the third period have three energy levels. Elements of the fourth period have four energy levels. I can go on and on and on, but it doesn't really change anything. Yes? I was going to say, I think it helps to imagine it as like rings. Yeah. Okay. You can, you can, um, we can do rings. If you think, you can think of the electrons circling around the atom. Okay? Like shells. Like onion. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Like shells and onion. And the first, energy level being the closest to the center to the nucleus so that's a nucleus sorry oh. that's the nucleus that's the first level that's the nucleus that's the first and the second like two layers mm -hmm. and for the third it's going to be nucleus and the first and the second and the third does that make sense? Yes. Better? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, and what I also say is you have to remember that for the first level, the maximum number of electrons can only be two. Starting from the second, the maximum number of electrons on the outer shell can only be eight. And something kind of a digression that I want to make a little bit to kind of clarify some issues. In many instances, we cannot ask the question why. There is no question why there are only eight electrons on the outer shell of the elements of second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on periods. If the number would be different, this world wouldn't exist. It would have different laws of physics. We wouldn't be here to ask that specific question. Does that make sense? It's like asking why the speed of light is a certain number. If that would be a different number, we probably have totally different universe in which probably there would be no us to ask the question why. Does that make sense? There are certain things which is discovered. We can provide mathematical explanations how things change in a nucleus, how things change in an atom, but we can't really explain like numbers. You see what I'm saying? So going back to our story, if we would look at the elements of the third period, starting with sodium, tell me please the first energy level. Is it full? It can only have two, all these elements from sodium to what's the argon? Sodium to argon. They all have two electrons on the first energy level. The first floor is occupied. Second floor, second energy level, how many electrons can it have? Is it full? Yes. 
You cannot add anything to the second. So the second floor is occupied. So which floor you can add electrons to? Which energy level? Third. And that's going to be the outer layer. The outer shell of your onion that is an atom. Does that make sense? That makes sense? That's the outer shell. So you have a nucleus. You have first layer, second layer, and the third layer. And this third layer is the one that you're going to be adding electrons to. Okay? And you're going to be adding them until you have how many? Outer shell always has eight. If you look at elements of, say, sixth period, which you can, we're not going to talk about them, I believe, ever, this course. But if you look at elements of, say, sixth period, they can have only eight electrons on the outer shell. That's the law. You can't have more than eight. That's it. We'll get there. You want to be complete, yes. We'll get there. Does that make sense so far? You good? That just, that just did. That's the law. Now, if we would get into the period four, you're going to see some complications. And here on this slide, you can see only two elements, which are potassium and calcium. Okay? Now, I genuinely, I do not remember. What's the next element? If you go over the fourth period, you go potassium S first. SP. No, no, no. No. Oh, SC. SC. I heard SE. Selenium, SC, scandium. So basically, if you would look at the color coding of the elements, you will see that the color of the square changes. You go from alkali earth metals to transitional methods. In yours, now it doesn't change here because this one, this one is different. May I grab this for a second? So we'll look at this one. Just look at the first two groups. Can you see the red ones? Mm -hmm. And then they become yellow. So those yellow ones are transitional metals. We'll try to find out if I can get some... Um, uh, do I have a table here? Yeah. So these two groups here, the first two, are metals, like true metals. And this part is transitional metals. That's transitional metals. Okay. The problem with transitional metals, they they are in terms of the electron arrangement different from elements in the principal groups like 1a, 2a, 3a, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8a. That makes sense. Look, they they don't get, they aren't a part of the principal groups. Do you see that? They, they are not assigned the group numbers like with the letter A. They assign the group numbers with the letter B. Does that make sense? Do you see that? Yeah. Okay. The reason why they are so weird is that, you see A and B? In their case, new electrons. So fourth period, how many um, energy levels total? Four. But with transition elements, new electrons are added not to the fourth level, but to the third one. And I totally expect from you. Hold on. Okay. No, it's everything works. It's perfect. Um, all right. So it turns out, so this, these numbers, show you the total number of electrons 
on different electron levels. Oh, that goes like imagine that you have an element of the with the six six energy levels. This is how many electrons you can have on the first one, the two, eight. You can have on the second. You can have eighteen on the third. You can have thirty-two on the fourth. Does that make sense? Now that becomes weird. And what I want you to understand is that at this point, it's weird. Yes. So this is only for the transition. That's for transition. Yes. Because when you get to, let me put it this way, when you get to prince elements that belong to the principal group, let's say to bromine, okay? Bromine is the element of, bromine should be fourth period, I believe, isn't it? Yeah. So bromine will have 18 electrons on the third layer and we'll have seven electrons on the fourth. What I'm trying to tell you is that our interest to, does not go beyond calcium. That's number one. It will actually be restricted to the first three periods. I promise not to go anywhere beyond that. Does that make sense? So we're going to be talking only about first three periods. Because when you go beyond that, when you go to the fourth and fifth, the algorithm of electrons filling up the energy levels changes so dramatically that it becomes a total and pure nightmare, which in my opinion defeats the purpose of learning chemistry. Does that make sense? You know what I'm talking about. So we try to figure out how to fill up the electron levels and we start to lose the forest behind the trees. So you, my message to you, take home message to you, is that first energy level can have only two electrons. Second energy level can have as much as eight, but that's it. And for the elements of the third period, the third energy level, which is the outermost, also can have only eight. Did I make myself clear? That's your take home message. We got it? First one, two, and then second one, eight, and so one, eight. Third one, eight, that's for the elements all the way up to the third period. Fourth, fifth, sixth, forget about it. Okay? That makes sense? We good? Now, I want to chat with you a little bit about certain, so that's, you know, how many electrons can potentially be on different levels? Ignore it. Okay? What I really want to focus on, considering what we just learned, are three main parameters atomic size, ionization energy and metallic character. We're going to learn what each of these terms means. And we're going to learn how these parameters for each atom change in the periodic table. Am I clear? So first, we're going to learn the concept of valence electrons and regarding valence electrons so that's the number of electrons that can be found on the outermost energy level now using your knowledge look at the element hydrogen and tell me how many energy levels does it have one, which is obviously the outermost level. 
How many electrons does it have on this? What's the number of valence electrons? <coughs> One. One. Now look at the element carbon. Now look at the carbon. Which period does it belong to? Second period. So how many energy levels does it have? Two. Two. How many electrons does carbon have on the first energy? Two, because it's full. How many electrons does carbon have in total? Six. So if it has two on the first, how many does it have on the second, which is the outermost? Four. Which is not, incidentally, the group number for carbon. How many valence electrons does carbon have? Four, exactly. So this list shows you that the group number corresponds to the number of valence electrons. Does that make sense? Why do we focus so much on the number of valence electrons? You can see that I'm a sucker for analogies, but this time I cannot give you any. Chemistry is the science that studies how, how atoms recombine, forming different molecules. Does that make sense? And in these molecules, atoms are connected to each other by chemical bonds. So far, am I clear? Chemical bonds are formed by the outermost electrons. Am I clear? So, for instance, look at... Um, magnesium. Look at magnesium. Which period does it belong to? Third, how many energy levels? Three. How many electrons on the first level? Two. Second, eight. Outermost, two. How many electrons will participate in the bond formation? Only two. Despite that it has 12 total, only two will participate in chemical reactions. Does that make sense? This is important to understand because that will explain which, you know, compounds a certain element can form. To describe the structure of the outermost electron level, we use Lewis electron dot structures. So, for instance, aluminum is in the group 3, principal group 3, 3A. Can you all find aluminum in the periodic table? It's going to have number atomic number 13. Got it? So, three valence electrons. That's the representation. Does that make sense? Got it? Now, if that's going to be a carbon, how many electrons on the outer shell? Four. Sorry, question? No. Four. So one, two, three, and four. Does that make sense? Think of it that uh, electrons can only be oriented north, south, east, and west. Does that make sense? You'll see it in a second. Chlorine. How many valence electrons does it have? Seven. Everybody understands why seven. It's in, it's in the seventh A group. Look at this. Does that make, can you see seventh A group? So, did you find chlorine? Yes. It's atomic number 17. You got it? So, I told you, this can be only north, south, west and east how many electrons did i place how many do i need to place three more i can put them in any three i can put for instance one more in the north one more in the south one more in the west sorry that one is constantly like disappearing think of it as like in a parking building you have like 
four apartments. You put a tenant in each apartment, north, south, east, and west, but they have to share. Okay? So if two more tenants coming in, you can put them in any two apartments to pair. Does that make sense? Okay. I don't want to go into the whole part of quantum theory why this happens, but this idea, it really, again, it will defeat the purpose of what we're learning here. But idea of north, south, east, and west kind of help you to draw the Lewis structure. Does that make sense? We good? Understood? So again, I promised only three first periods. I'm not going to go anywhere beyond that. Um, if you have less than four, you can put them anywhere. Like all these structures are legit. That makes sense? There's no difference whatsoever. Okay. So that electron structure for magnesium means that it has two valence electrons. And this table right here shows you the Lewis structures for different elements. So for instance, if you would look at the elements of the first group, now there's one comment that I want to make. What's the, what's the perfect number for the outer shell? Okay. Look at sodium or potassium or lithium, specifically these three. How many electrons do they have on the outer shell? One. One. How many more they need to complete it? Seven. Seven. Hold that thought. Just, just keep, keep, keep thinking about it. So just remember that they have one and they need seven more. To be happy, to have eight, to be complete. Huh? They need to get seven more. It's a lot. Chlorine. How many does it have? Seven. How many does it need to complete, to be happy? Mm -hmm. One. One. Which of these elements is more likely to give electrons or to accept electrons? Yeah, sodium, like, it's like, you know, like, if you have, like, trading cards, like, if you have just one baseball card, and your friend has seven baseball cards, chances that you're going to, you know, get seven cards from your friend are second to none, he's going to give yours to your friend, like, in exchange for something, I don't know. Does that make sense? So your friend's happy, you're happy, everybody's happy. Does that make sense? So that is kind of explains the behavior of the elements in a certain compound. So if we would take sodium and chlorine, how many electrons does chlorine have, remind me? On the outer shell? On the outer shell? Chlorine. Seven. How many does it need to complete it to perfect eight? Just one. How many sodium has? That's the match made in heaven. Sodium gives its electron to chlorine. Okay, now when chlorine gets this electron, how does it change its charge? Becomes negative, becomes negative ion. When sodium loses electron, what happens to sodium? Becomes positive ion. So we have that ionic compound that we were talking about in class. Overall, it's neutral, but there are two ions. Does that make sense? Look at noble gases. How many did I have? Perfect. All tenants are in place. It's fantastic. Does that make sense? So that kind of ex and that kind of explains you the behavior of the elements in terms of giving electrons away or accepting electrons, taking them over. Does that make sense? Now, you may ask, uh, what happens in the middle? Eh, it's like a Facebook status. It's complicated. You know? So, basically, basically, what we can say, that first two principal groups, 1A and 2A, 
they sure will give electrons away. They will lose them. Am I clear? Last two groups? Well, noble gases, forget about them. They just, they're perfect. They're perfect. Nothing to talk about. Okay? So, group 6 and group 7a, they will accept electrons. Generally speaking. Does that make sense? Especially... 7 and 8? 6 and 7. 8 is perfect. 8 is perfect. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions about this idea of giving electrons away to become... Oh, by the way, when sodium... Sodium, which period does it belong to? I don't know. Huh? Third. So, how many electrons does it have in the first energy level? Two. Two. First, the closest. Second, eight. eight. Third, one. When it loses one electron, does it have any electrons on the outer energy level? No, no it pr practically doesn't exist anymore. What is the next energy level that exists? Second. The second. How many electrons does it have there? Eight. That's perfect. Isn't it? Yes. So that does the third energy level just... I mean... We wonder in the quantum world, if there are no electrons, energy level isn't a physical entity. Does that make sense? Energy level isn't an empty bookshelf that you can touch or probe or observe using some weird microscopy. It's more of a concept. Does that make sense? You see what I'm trying to say? So... When all outer electrons are gone, the next level becomes the outer one. And if it has eight, that's perfect. We're good? Got it? Great. So...